Colorado stands with New Zealand and with Muslims facing hate here at home. We look at whether anyone in our state is tracking anonymous anger online, the kind that fueled the terrorist attack on those mosques. The governor's number one promise runs into hard reality at the Capitol. Will Truth test a political ad running on 9 News right now? Why are people running political ads now? Checking in with ranchers on the plains, the people who feared the blizzard would wipe out livestock. And the last business you'd expect to be impacted by the storm couldn't handle the pressure and the cold. That's next. Coloradans will gather tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock at that big mosque on Parker Road. It's an open invitation for all to stand in solidarity with the victims of the terrorist attack on mosques in New Zealand. It will double as a call for peace. At that same Islamic Center's noon service today, they honored the 49 people killed in New Zealand. The Arapahoe County Sheriff was there, a sign of security and support. Denver and Aurora Police also say they are increasing patrols to protect Colorado's Muslim community. Four people have been arrested in those attacks in New Zealand, which investigators say were streamed online. The shooting suspect left a long online trail, mixing white supremacy with the kind of pointless, sometimes harmless, anonymous trash talking that fuels a whole internet subculture of socially disconnected losers. The head of the local Anti-Defamation League says hate online is often tough to track, yet they're collecting weekly reports on extremism that other people unearth on the internet. It is difficult to track. I, our organization and others don't actually have the manpower, the means of the desire to be able to look at everything that's going on on social media, but things do get reported to us on a very regular basis. Colorado, unfortunately, we found out was third largest just by gross numbers, not per capita, of propaganda from white supremacists during the past year. The ADL compiles those reports of online hate and passes them along to law enforcement. The red flag gun control bill is getting its first hearing in the state Senate right now. Democrats do not need any Republican votes to pass it, but they can't have many party defections if they're going to change Colorado law to allow judges to order someone's guns to be temporarily seized because they're a danger. Opponents today focused on the red flag bill being used as a weapon itself, a means of revenge by people making false reports against gun owners. The bill provides for an extremely low burden of proof for entry of this initial ex parte order. This bill will provide an essential tool for police officers to temporarily restrict the individual's access to firearms. More than a dozen conservative counties have declared themselves Second Amendment sanctuaries. Sheriffs there who vow not to enforce judges' red flag orders risk being held in contempt of court. One problem with Governor Polis' promises is that he made a whole pile of them, and they're beginning to bump up against each other in the legislature, and it's causing some friction. Polis' first promise was full-day kindergarten. That's conflicting with another promise of increased regulations on oil and gas. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is stuck in the middle of it all. We get it. Colorado is rolling in the green, at least right now, according to the update the state's budget committee just got on the state's piggy bank. There's another $29.6 available um, in the general fund. But beyond 2020, the outlook isn't so rosy. We have also seen home price appreciation slow in the state of Colorado. And what's driving that slowdown is largely the higher cost areas of the state have finally started to level off. Here's why home values and perhaps that oil and gas bill could impact the state paying for full day kindergarten. There's a formula that determines how much school districts get each year. Whatever local property taxes don't cover, the state pays the difference. Right now, higher property values means the state doesn't have to pay as much to districts, so the state can spend money elsewhere, like maybe full day kindergarten. What happens if those property taxes paid by oil and gas start to decline because of the impact of Senate Bill 181. You can't put that much new regulation on an industry and expect it to remain constant. Republican Senator Bob Rankin doesn't want to approve the $227 million for full-day kindergarten this year if the state may have trouble finding the money in later years. I don't think we're going to have uh, less production, uh, but Oil and gas revenues, as we all know, are volatile. As we highlighted yesterday, even Democrats are cautious about fulfilling Polis's promise on kindergarten on year one. We need to take pause on, you know, very large fiscal commitments to the state budget. 
The Budget Committee will decide sometime next week what it will recommend to the full legislature on whether or not, Kyle, it will fund full day kindergarten or recommend a phased in approach, which wasn't exactly Polis's promise, mm -hmm. but Again, if it happens over time, we were told yesterday, it's still a promise fulfilled. And we see this every single legislative session. There are always competing priorities, but this year the squeeze is really on because you have a lot of expensive promises being made and the potential for that reduction in revenue. And the fact that it has to be paid that same amount or more every it, year. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, Marshall, thank you very much. So the oil and gas industry is worried enough about those tough new regulations being considered that they're digging into their own deep pockets to run some campaign style ads on our air. Perhaps you've seen them. That led Marshall to fire up the old truth test machine in what used to be the off season. Last fall, Coloradans went to the ballot box and voted overwhelmingly against Proposition 112. This is true, depending on your definition of overwhelmingly. Proposition 112 was defeated 55% to 45%. They voted to protect funding for schools, protect jobs, and protect our way of life. That's a stretch. We don't know why 55% voted against Proposition 112, which would have restricted where oil and gas operations could set up in relation to homes, schools, even streams. But a handful of politicians didn't like that result and think they know better. So now they're trying to ignore the voters and pass a law in the middle of the night to shut down energy production in Colorado. Whoa, let's examine some of these overstatements. Pass a law in the middle of the night? The bill this political ad is about is Senate Bill 181, the oil and gas reform bill that we've talked extensively about. On March 5th, it had its first hearing starting at 2 p.m. Testimony lasted into the night and the ultimate vote passing it out of the committee happened almost at 2 a.m. The vote to advance the bill happened in the middle of the night, but it did not happen blindly with no one noticing or participating. And it has quite a few more steps before becoming law. Now about the claim this bill will shut down energy production in Colorado, local governments would have control over where operations can exist, but the state could implement stricter regulations. The state commission that oversees oil and gas would also be required to put more of a focus on the public's health and safety, which could impact the approval of future oil and gas permits. The ad could have made the argument this is happening quickly, but it's not in the cover of night. With this truth test, I'm Marshall Zellinger. That oil and gas bill has its first hearing on the House side Monday, and you can expect to see that ad running on TV stations throughout the month. This may be one of the few times that you'll see a crowd out at Mile High when the Broncos are not playing. Hundreds of Excel crews were there today. It's where they staged before they headed out to restore power to thousands of customers who've been in the dark for days. The crews came in from out of state, from Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, Wisconsin, among them. There are still about 8,000 customers without power, although Excel is hoping to have everyone's lights back on tonight. State Patrol Corporal Dan Groves headed for I-76 during the worst of that blizzard because he knew that was a place where he would surely find people in need. He was hit and killed helping a driver on the day of the blizzard there. Investigators say a 58-year-old man from Centennial lost control of his vehicle and struck and killed Groves. Fellow troopers gathered today in front of the State Patrol Academy to remember him. He's a 12 year veteran who first started out working up in Frisco. The state patrol chief says the best way that any of us can honor Groves' memory is to move over for law enforcement, to give them room to operate on the side of the road. Driving a car, whether it's sunny or snowy, calm or windy, requires your highest level of care. There cannot be anything more important than what you're doing in that moment lives are at stake. So we want to tell you about a 10 year old boy in Florida who honors fallen law enforcement officers like Corporal Groves. This young man runs a mile for each officer lost. Last night, Zechariah Cartledge ran with the blue line flag in remembrance of Corporal Groves. So I'm going to be honoring him tonight well by running four and a half laps around my loop. Two officers from the Winter Springs Police Department down yeah, in Florida ran with Zechariah. He expects that he will run 150 miles this year to honor all the law enforcement officers lost in 2018, and he adds additional miles for each officer killed this year. So were those the blizzard may be in your rear view, but people were still out retrieving their abandoned cars in Elbert County today. This was the first that anybody could get to County Line Road 194. 
A group of volunteers went out with shovels and chains, even brought a tractor to dig out, all so that they would not have to pay for a very expensive tow. We told you about a loophole in Colorado law that allows adults to sext some kids. It is totally legal right now for an adult to sext a teenager who's 15, 16, or 17 years old, so long as police and prosecutors never get their hands on any photos or videos. A proposed bill would close that loophole, and it passed through its first legislative committee today. Back in December, we told you about a teacher up in Craig who was found not guilty of sexual exploitation of a child. He was accused of exchanging inappropriate photos with a teenager, but the photos and video were never recovered. The bill would eliminate the need to have those images in order to get a conviction. It would also make it illegal to send sexually explicit messages to one of those young teenagers. Governor Jared Polis today privately signed a bill to link Colorado's electoral votes for president to the national popular vote, so long as enough other states eventually agree to do that. Now, Democrats did not make this a centerpiece of their campaigns, so it was kind of suddenly contentious at the Capitol, and there wasn't a single Republican who voted for it there. Opponents now plan to gather 124,000 signatures and put it up for your popular vote on the ballot. My shop is literally right across the street, but there's no power on that side of the road. The lasting impact of this week's big storm on small business. Just a warm, warm, warm shop and a bench is nice. <laughs> and it's a sign that drivers needed some extra help here. That's next. The nightmare storm scenario never materialized for ranchers on the eastern plains. This week's blizzard had the potential to devastate livestock right at the start of calving season. The Colorado Livestock Association tells us they did not see the terrible losses they feared. Now, some livestock was lost for sure. In Elbert County, where 14 inches of snow fell, about 50 calves were born in the storm. Less than a dozen didn't make it. It could have been a lot worse. It, it, we're thankful it could have been a lot worse. Had that storm lasted two or three days, it could have been catastrophic. As hard as this one event was on the livestock and us, this is a game-changing 
moisture event that will allow us to uh, be productive and successful going forward in the next six, eight months. Decky Spiller was telling us that the due date for most of the calves in Elbert County was today. And sure enough, that drop in the barometric pressure during the bomb cyclone caused the heifers to go into early labor. <laughs> this talk of snow who's ready to get up into that powder and go skiing you know what travel and traffic on i-70 this hour looking really good and how about looking good downtown denver clear skies light winds 47 downtown 39 at the airport so not quite where we should be for this time of year but with high pressure building in over the area and the storm track to the north we're going to enjoy a couple of mild dry days and better travel weather our storm creating blizzard conditions in the midwest cold air and travel delays in the northeast while we're just looking good here for the next couple of days. We have sunshine, lighter winds and temperatures that won't be quite at the average number, but warm enough. Fair skies in 18 tonight, a cool, calm, quiet night. Tomorrow, sunshine and 48. We get you into St. Patrick's Day with temperatures in the 50s, isolated showers Monday night, a warming trend midweek and a few more showers on Thursday and Friday with temperatures near 60. So right now let's roll into the weekend like Nugget, the mini Aussie Kyle. Kathy, thank you. Hey, it's a sign that has some drivers in Commerce City confused. They were actually hoping to do just the opposite with the sign that was spotted by an next viewer named Mishra. She asked us on Facebook, so do not enter, but if you do enter, stop? I mean, look at that. A stop sign is facing the exact same way just off there in the distance. Why would you be stopping if you do not enter there? So here's the deal. Commerce City tells us that stretch of East of 72nd Place, East 72nd Place near Highway 2, it used to be two-way. It was changed to one way when the highway was widened, but drivers are used to the old way of doing things. They kept going the wrong way, so the city figured, you know what? Leave up the stop sign. If they blow past the do not enter, it should at least keep them off the highway. You ready for campaign season already? If you live in Denver, you better be prepared. We hear that the campaign text messages have already started. City Council candidate Candy Cedabaca confirmed to us that yet viewers have received some text messages from her campaign. They get the numbers from the state Democratic Party, which gets them from the Secretary of State's office. When you put down a number, when you register to vote, that is public information. People, including parties, can get it. Although the Democratic Party told us that if you ask for your name to be removed from one candidate's list, it should be removed from their master list. This is about one of the few things I can do without power. Making work work when the blizzard still impacts your small business. Yeah, man, things will be okay. We'll just keep whittling away. And every Friday you get the last word, and it's a good one with your good news next.
Mi Vida Violin is on day three of the blizzard now. Yeah, the snow stopped on day one, just like for everybody else, but they remain in the dark. And even in the daylight, the cold apparently is no good at all for the business of making violins. Our Byron Reed talked to the owner about his plan B. You know, for 250 years, people did this by candlelight. Eric Trujillo knows a little about patience. I'm trimming crack cleats here on this violin. When it comes to caring for musical instruments. And I'm actually a jazz saxophone player, but I was always good with woodworking. He's been making and repairing violins for 25 years, a skill that requires a steady hand. I have a 200-year-old instrument that has some cracks in it and it's being restored for a symphony musician. Trujillo and his wife own Mavita Strings in Westminster and three days ago. Yeah, we had the cyclone bomb. They lost their source for lights and heat. Wednesday morning first thing came in and about half an hour later the power was gone. <laughs> we're in my shop here in Mavita Strings where I normally am. Uh, but because of the power outages, uh, it's too cold. Cold weather can affect the varnishes and glues. That caused Trujillo to do some ad-libbing of his own. Two or three days of work can make a big deal and can be a big difference in the wallet too, you know? An issue a neighboring business wanted to help fix by offering him a spot in their office right across the street. The Arachio architecture firm uh, reached out and was, was warm and generous and offered for me to come and work in the shop. So Trujillo can keep paying attention to the fine details. And a steady hand's hard to do when it's shivering cold and, you know. <laughs> of caring for the instruments that bring him peace. Part of maybe that jazz musician in me that knows how to improvise, we improvise in life. And some people say it's making lemonade. For next? Yeah, man, things will be okay. We'll just keep whittling away. I'm Byron Reed. I would not have been able to tell you that somebody in our community was making violins from scratch. That's pretty cool. Trujillo says they had to move part of their inventory and the client instruments to another location to keep the violins wood warm. And we got late word, they have their power. They're back in business. Each Friday ends with your good news. And most Fridays also end with concerns about my clothing. That's next.
Friday's final word is always your good news. And we heard from Allison who told us about her run, one year old Remy who had his second or had her second sex successful surgery. Hip surgery is recovering well. And then there was Mariel who got in touch to share the story of her little guy whose ultrasound showed that both of his kidneys are working well after surgery in October. The family is celebrating with a cake which reads you're in the clear. I love this. You people are hilarious. That's the reason why we get along so well. Your feedback now. Sherry Z writes in to say, we love the good news at the end of the week. Could you please mention I am grateful for my husband, Lou, and the fact that today is our 25th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Pam says, thanks for starting off the show with a call to love, extending the reach, the invitation for us to come together as a community at the Denver Mosque tomorrow night. And Judy B writes in to say, tell Kyle green is not his color. Well, Judy, it's a little late now. The show has concluded. I apologize. See you next time. Oh, news out. News out. We're supposed to say that now.